Hi, uh, my name is Alexa. I am a student advisor here at UQ Student Services. Uh, just checking that everyone can hear me. Yes, I can Thank hear you. Thank you. I like to double check because I have had a few sound issues with some of these previous uh, presentations. Uh, like I said, I'm Alexa. I'm a student advisor. I help students here at UQ with a range of disability, uh, welfare, getting settled in. Uh, we also have some members of the HASS faculty who are also joining us today who can maybe answer some more direct questions. If our members from the HASS faculty wouldn't mind saying hello. Hi, my name's Cal. Um, I can't actually turn my video on at the moment, unfortunately. I don't think it's allowing me to do that. Um, but I'm a part of the Has Student Futures team and it's lovely to welcome you all. Uh, and I look forward to answering all of the questions that you might have today in relation to enrolling. Okay. Hello. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry. I'm Belinda. Okay. Um, I'm a student administration officer. I'm here to, yeah, here to basically help with um, any questions that you might have at the end. And if you do have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A, okay? And once again, thank you to our members of the faculty for joining us. Uh, their understanding of these topics will be much better than mine. Uh, so it's really valuable, the uh, extra information that they can provide. Okay, so let's get started. So, okay, so the first thing that we do here at UQ is we do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, this is a very special thing that I really appreciate doing in the start of every presentation uh, because the cultural and uh, the relevance and the, the amazing uh, enrichment of our, our lives that the, our Aboriginal community is really important to me. So the University of Queensland, UQ, acknowledges the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet. So we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Okay, so we're going to start off with some key information. So we're going to look at the enrolment dates. Uh, understanding the difference between faculty and school because that catches lots of people out, uh, different modes of study and understanding your electronic course profile. So first we've got some key dates. So uh, timetabling will start next Monday the 19th and then you've got to the 3rd of July to uh, put in your preferences. Uh, how do you do that? You will find out in this presentation. Uh, the last date to request a program change through, through my sign is the 14th of July. The 14th of July is also the last date to enrol if you're a domestic student. Uh, orientation week is the 17th to the 21st of July. Uh, we also call it O Week. There will be heaps of really fun things uh, on campus and online, so make sure you get involved. Uh, the 21st of July is uh, the international students due date to enrol, so make sure you enrol by then. Uh, the 24th of July uh, is the week one, so when classes commence. And the 4th of August is the last date for additional courses or alteration of enrolment uh, and due date for payment of fees and charges. Okay. And then the 31st of August is census date. So this is the last date to drop courses or cancel enrolment without financial penalty. So you need to make sure that you are really sure about what courses you are in and you finalised everything by the very, very latest, the 31st of August. So you will hear us talking about faculties and schools. Uh, you might say, what's the difference? So we have the faculties down the side. So they are uh, a larger organisations that UQ is uh, split up into. And then within each faculty, there is different schools. So we can see uh, our faculties there. So the business, economics and law, uh, engineering, architecture, information technology, health and behavioural sciences, uh, humanities and social sciences, which is your faculty, uh, medicine faculty and science faculty. And then if we look at the schools on the side, we can easily kind of see some of the ones which we can probably guess which faculties they're in. So uh, business is, uh, the School of Business is clearly going to be in the business, economics and law faculty. So these are smaller organisation units within the faculties. Uh, law, once again, is also in the Bell faculty. A chemical engineering is going to be in engineering. So you can kind of look down and you can kind of figure out which, organ, which faculty they're in, okay? So you might be uh, told to go talk to someone at the faculty. 
which will be Hass, but then it'd be also important for you to know which school you are in because in case you need to talk to someone at that school. Okay, we're gonna look at some key terminology. Now, some of this will be terminology that you have already aware of that you might've studied at other places and they might use. Some of it might be some UQ specific stuff. We do like to give out our different names to things. So enrollment, uh, hopefully you've heard that before. So when you enroll in your courses, timetabling is where you select preference is for your classes and the times for each course. Now here are where it might be different. We call a degree a program, okay? So a UQ degrees are called programs. So you might be doing a Bachelor of Arts, Masters of Psychology, those kinds of things. And then we have courses. So those are the subjects within your program, okay? So you might know them as subjects at other places, uh, but here we use the term course. So you have a uh, set of courses that make up your program, okay? And then we have a unit. Okay, so this is the value of individual courses. So most courses will be two units, uh, but if you are, say, doing a, a placement, so if they are, uh, let's make it faculty specific, uh, if you are doing teaching and you have to do a teaching placement, it might go for the whole semester and it might be eight units for one course instead of four individual two-unit courses, okay? Okay. Uh, and then the course coordinator. So this is the person who's designed the course and they're most likely going to be the main lecturer. They will, you'll be able to know who they are because their names will be on your ECPs, which we'll get to. Okay, so electronic course profile or ECP. So each course has an ECP that contains the important information about the course. Uh, very, one thing that I recommend to students is when they are, uh, having any issues is reading the ECP, seeing uh, what the assessments are, what the learning uh, outcomes are, what the learning activities are. Uh, it's a really great first point of call if you are confused about your course. Okay, and then you might have compulsory courses and elective courses. Uh, the number of each will maybe depend on what type of course you're doing. Uh, so compulsory courses are one that you have to do. If you don't do them, then you won't complete your program. Uh, but then the electives, uh, they can make up different majors and minors or different options okay so the major and the minor major combines courses in a program focusing on a specific discipline uh, minors are similar but they require fewer courses okay and then we've got the types of learning so we've got a lecture uh, so it's a presentation delivered by an academic it's where you'll get most of your theory it is I think possibly the main uh, type of class that we have here uh, then you'll probably have some tutorials. So tutorials or tutes are held in smaller classrooms involve interaction between students and a tutor. So that might be a bit more interactive. You might be able to maybe develop your own ideas a bit uh, with some feedback from your tutors in those. Uh, other types that you might have, you might have workshops. Uh, and if you are doing anything that involves like a laboratory, then you might have labs. Okay, then we've also got contact hours. So this will be in your ECP and the number of hours per week teaching activities for each course. Okay, so you've got your lectures, tutorials, workshops. Okay, so make sure that you're checking that and not just going to the lecture or just the tutorials, that you're going to the all of the ones that you were told to do. Okay. Okay, so we just have an important note before we go on. The full-time study load is eight units, which is generally four courses. Obviously, like I said previously, if you're on, say, a placement, it might be less. It uh, might just be one course, but you need to be aware that you need to, to be doing those eight units as part of your visa unless you have specific uh, permission. Okay, so international students with a student visa have to complete their program by the end date on their confirmation of enrollment, so your COE. Uh, if you want to reduce the amount of courses you are to or undertake this semester, we advise you to speak to the student services and your faculty. So don't just drop courses uh, to a lesser load without talking to someone because it can have an impact on your visa and your COE. Okay, so really seek advice if you do need to uh, uh, do this or you want to talk about it. Okay. Uh, once again, if you do, if you are having questions, feel free to pop them in the Q and A, and we can answer them at the end. Okay. Okay. So now we've got the grade structure. 
So a seven is the high distinction. Let's all aim for that. Uh, it's a, it might not be possible, but it's a good uh, place to kind of aim for. So a six is a distinction, a five is a credit, and a four is a pass, okay? So to pass the minimum you can get is a four. Now, if you get a three, you can potentially apply for a supplementary assessment, which would be an extra piece of assessment that would allow you to then get a four, but you can't get higher than a four on a supplementary, okay? If you get a two or a one, you cannot apply for a supplementary, okay? And you will have to repeat it if it's a, if it's a compulsory. If it's an elective and you want to do something else instead, then you can obviously do an alternative, okay? And it's, well, I just want to highlight the tip that we've got there. So we do not mark on a curve. Okay, so you achieve against yourself and not your classmates. Okay, so course attendance mode. So courses in your program may be available in more than one delivery mode, depending on your program and course requirements. Now, the vast bulk of our courses are in person. Uh, so I really think it's a good idea to read the ECPs about what the in-person requirements are. So you're, for in-person, you're required to engage in-person learning and assessment at a UQ campus or other location at some spot, at some point. So uh, even though it's in-person, there may be some uh, elements of online delivery. So their lectures will probably be recorded and available on Blackboard. Uh, there might be online tutorials, online assessments, uh, those kinds of things but it still is primarily an in-person mode. Uh, then we do have some external courses that are delivered entirely online and students must participate online for all learning and assessment, okay? But always check your ECP for information about attendance modes. All right, so here we are at ECPs. I've mentioned it how many times already, so I might just break it down for you. So your electronic course profile contains information on courses, including the course objectives and aims, the learning resources required. So if you need to be getting certain textbooks or specific software uh, or reading certain articles, uh, it has the course learning and teaching activities, uh, and it generally will show them broken down week to week, which is really great because it's really great for those of you who really like to plan out their semesters, as well as the assessment tasks. So you can go on, as soon as you get your ECPs, go on and read all those assessment tasks, mark them all in your calendar. Uh, if you need help with them, then you, you know that you can get help uh, early. Okay. So there's multiple ways uh, to view your ECP. Uh, one way is if you're already enrolled in it, you can log on to my sign it. You will need to log in with your student login and you can get this via your dashboard. Select the enrollments tile and we will have a graphic later that I can easily point that out to you. Uh, click on the blue information icon beside the course code. Okay, so uh, please note that some of the ECPs might not be available currently. They There has been some updating, uh, so they might not all be available. You, can still check old ones, but make sure you update your information by reading the new ones when they do come out. Okay, so other ways you can access your ECP. So you can uh, search in your course and programs on through for your course on the programs and courses website. Okay, you can just Google your course code. Quite often, I just put UQ, put the course code, and find it. Uh, but if you are googling it, making sure you get the right year and the right semester. So what does it look like? So this is the this is an example of what a basic ECP looks like. So we've got some course information, aims and objectives, learning resources, learning activities, assessment, policies and guidelines, and a learning summary. Okay. You can click through the different web pages. You can switch to print view if you just want it in one big document or you want to print it out. So it starts off with some general information. So we can already see some of the stuff there that we've already talked about. So we've got the contract hours per week. So we can check that straight away. We can see it's two units. Uh, we can see that it's in person. Okay, we can see that it's a post-grad level. Okay, so that's all that great information we've already talked about. Uh, and then we've got some learning resources. So for this one, there's no required resources, but it's got a number of recommended resources. Okay, and then we've got some teaching and learning activities. So like I said, we've got it separated out into different weeks. So I could open my calendar and I could put that uh, week one, we're doing introduction to cognitive assessment. 
So I know exactly what I'm doing each week. And then I've also got the assessments on the next page. So I know that I've got an exam for this one and I know I've got a report. Okay. And I know it's, it's uh, the exam is 30% and the report is 70%. So we can see it just looking like that really quickly, how much uh, really important information we can get. Okay. Uh, I don't have a picture of it, but I would also recommend uh, reading the policies and things like that, that are in your ECP, especially around uh, extensions uh, and kind of the their rules around that. Also things like if a supplementary is available. So if you do, unfortunately, something happens and you get a three, if you can apply for a supplementary for that course. So I would definitely be reading your ECPs. Okay. So we've picked what courses we want to do. Now we need to enroll in them. So we're going to look at my sign it. We're going to look at enrolling in your courses and then also where to go for course advice and help. So accessing my sign it. Uh, you can either go to that uh, link there or you can follow the link on your UQ dashboard. Uh, if you're not sure how to access your dashboard, sometimes the easiest thing is to scroll to the bottom of a UQ web page and it's right there. Okay, so we can see a whole range of stuff here, but we're going to focus first on my sign it. So this is what your uh, my sign it front page will look like. So here we will enroll in our courses in the enrollments tile that we can see there. Uh, we will update our personal details. Now, if you are an international student or a domestic student who is moving to Brisbane for study, Please, as soon as you have moved and you have an updated address and updated phone number, update your personal details, okay? It's really important that students keep their personal details uh, updated for a number of reasons, okay? So make sure as soon as you get here and you've got that new address that you update your personal details. Uh, you can pay your fees through here. So this uh, person owes $50. Uh, you can view your final grades and you can request a, pro a change of program. So if you're doing a... Uh, one batch and you would like to switch to another, then you can put a request in here. Once again, I would recommend talking to someone about it first, not just making a change, uh, but you can do the admin through here. Uh, you can get your summary of your program. You can defer your exams in here and also apply for a supplementary. Okay, so there's a whole range of things that you can do through your MySignIt. So, We've picked our courses, we've logged in, we've clicked the enrollment tile, and now let's enroll. So first we're going to add a course. We're gonna search for it, either if you know the specific uh, course code that you want to enroll in, you can search by that, or you can search by a subject area. Uh, once you've found it, you can click enroll. This seems to be quite an easy step through process. Okay. Now, if you're not sure about what courses you are supposed to be enrolling in, or if you want to discuss the ones you have picked, or if you need to change, uh, then you can talk to an academic advisor at your faculty. Okay. Uh, can my colleagues at faculty please confirm for me if your academic advisors are at a faculty level or a school level? They're at a faculty level. Okay, that's handy yeah. to know. Uh, different faculties have different, so uh, diff another faculty has them, they're all in at the school level. So that's handy to know uh, before you uh, go looking and going round and round. So <laughs> uh, I always, and I don't always know because I'm not in a faculty. Uh, so thank you for confirming that. Okay. Now, if you've got any other course of advice questions, uh, please pop them in the Q&A and we will talk about them at the end. Okay, so now we've picked our courses, we're enrolled, uh, and now we can talk about timetabling. So we're gonna talk about the allocation process. We're gonna talk about those important dates, um, how to choose your classes, what they might look like, how to preference, how to make changes and where to go for advice and help. So like I said at the start, 19th of June, which is Monday, I'm going to say, I'm pretty sure it's Monday, uh, your student preferences will open, okay? And then you've got to the 3rd of July to do those preferences, okay? So make sure you do it within that section, that time frame. 
It doesn't matter whereabouts in the time frame you do it, just as long as you do it in the time frame. Then they will shut. You will get an, uh, a timetable. And then the on the 10th of July, you will get your timetable and you can adjust and swap, okay? And that is open till the 7th of August. Where is the first one? It didn't matter what time you, you did it. This one, it does. Uh, because if you want to be waitlisted for a certain uh, time, uh, the earlier you go on and do it, the higher up in the waitlist you will get. Okay. Now, just because you're waitlisted doesn't mean uh, you will be given it. Uh, it will depend on if other people are switching out of that course and that time. Okay. Okay. So choosing your class times. So you've enrolled in your courses and you need to select your pr preferred class times. Your classes will be allocated based on the preferences you select. So really think about uh, how to manage your time. This step is called class preferencing. Uh, to select your preferred class times, you'll need to register your preferred times through my timetable, uh, our class allocation system. And once again, we can see our little tile of our dashboard and we can see my timetable. Okay. Uh, there is also, we will watch a video in a second on how to do your preferencing, uh, but there is also a planner that you can use within my timetable that can help you if you are really stuck and you're not quite sure how to start. Uh, and it can kind of maybe help you uh, along with the process. But we'll now watch a video. I think the video is the next slide about how to do your preferences. This video will help you preference your classes using My Timetable. Through the My UQ portal, you can access the My Timetable application on the left-hand side toolbar. On the left of screen, you can view the courses in which you are enrolled. Any class marked with a red symbol requires your attention. When you are notified with a yellow symbol, your preferences for this class are pending. When you are notified with a green symbol, this class has been allocated and requires no further attention. Select a class to enter your preferences. View all available class times displayed in either list or timetable format by switching between the views on the top right-hand corner. Next to the preference drop-down menu, a percentage will indicate the popularity of the class. To preference a class, you can use a drop-down menu to nominate your preference. Where there are four or more options, you will be required to select a minimum of four preferences. Where there are a large number of options, you can choose a maximum of ten preferences. Then select Save. Here, you will be successfully notified of your progress. Now that we have input our preferences into each class, Yellow symbols indicate our preferences are saved and pending allocation. When the class preferencing window has closed, my timetable will be unavailable for a few days. During this time, the system will create your personalised timetable based on your preferences. This video will help you. Okay, so that's why it's really important to do uh, that preferencing within that time frame. Uh, so you've done that. It's been shut for a few weeks, uh, for a few days, and now you can uh, make some changes. Okay, so once you've received that uh, timetable that's created, you can do some adjustments. So you can review your allocated timetable. Uh, if there's if your situation has changed and you want to switch to another class time, you can, if there's space. If there's not space, you can add to the wait list and we'll, we'll watch in a video again on how to do that. And you can allocate yourself to classes you missed during the class preferencing stage. So if you maybe changed, okay? So it's also really important to review your timetable as soon as you can. The earlier you swap or wait list, the better chance you have of getting the timetable you want. So maybe even set a time, a, a alarm for when it is open and do it straight away. Okay.
You now have your personalised timetable that can be accessed through the MyUQ portal via the timetable application on the left-hand side toolbar. If your situation changes and your timetable no longer suits, you can make changes during the class adjustment stage. On the left of the screen, you can view the courses in which you are enrolled. If there is a green symbol, your classes have been allocated. After the allocation process is complete and where places are available, you are able to change your allocation by clicking the select button next to your preferred class. If a class is full, you can request a swap by clicking the heart icon. You will then become waitlisted and allocated if a place becomes available. If you change your mind, you can deselect the swap request by clicking the heart icon. If you see a clash, you will not be able to allocate to this class. You now have... Okay. So if you would like to watch those videos again, as well as one on how to use the planner, you can just search for enrollment in class allocation, UQ, uh, and you will be able to watch those videos again if you still kind of want to go over them about how to do it. Uh, if you need to talk to someone about your timetable, uh, please contact the uh, email address that is on your screen. So for Hass faculty, so has.mytimetable at uq.edu.au. Uh, and they can help you. Uh, understandably, they're probably going to get a lot of emails uh, in the next few weeks slash two months. Uh, so please be patient if it does take them a little time to get back to you. Okay, we're nearly at the end. Uh, I would really love it if you could just complete a short survey. We always like to uh, do surveys on our presentation so that we can improve uh, them, make them more relevant to students, uh, if there's something that we think uh, needs changing. So highly recommend you do that now. I'll give you a minute to just do it. Okay. So we're just going to uh, look at some important reminders before we go on to the different questions. Uh, and if you do have anything that you do want answered, especially if it's faculty specific things, then please uh, pop it in the Q&A. So we're going to talk about the academic integrity model uh, modules and English for academic communication. So you will have to complete the academic integrity modules, okay? So these are designed to help you understand your obligations and responsibilities as a UQ student, okay? Academic integrity describes the ethical principles that underpin academia and student life, okay? So it's really important that you do them and you need to do them by these dates. So part A by the 31st of August and part B by the 27th of October. Okay, so you can access them uh, on the edX Edge platform and you just click enroll and now to get started. Okay, so they're intended to be completed once. Now, if you are having trouble accessing these modules, then you can contact the library. So the UQ Library Ask Us uh, in person and I think on their website, they also have a little pop-up uh, box uh, if you do have technical trouble. Additionally, uh, we also have English for academic communication courses. So if this is the first time you are studying in English uh, and you're a bit worried about your English level, I highly recommend uh, signing up for English for academic communication courses. So they're run by our UQ college. Uh, so they are free, they're interactive workshops. They can help you uh, improve your communication in academic contexts and it also help you uh, be involved in UQ academic life. Okay. So I really recommend, uh, Signing up for those if you if your English is something that you are worried about. Okay, so we will go on to questions. I'll start with the ones in the Q and A. Uh, if you want to, there's still plenty of time to uh, add questions. If you do, okay.
Uh, first one, I, you might have to talk to IT. Uh, so why whenever you open my UQ's website, it will show that you I am missing something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the context. Uh, if our lovely faculty representatives had an, any idea, um, feel free to answer it. Otherwise, I would say you might need to talk to IT. Yeah, if, uh, I think you... Yeah, if... Um... If IT say that it's related to his program, just email us at has at uq.edu.au. Okay, excellent. Talk to IT. Uh, okay, so Ella says, I'm coming from previous study into a, the second semester, intend to be enrolled in three papers and then do summer school. Uh, does this meet the requirement for full-time study? So it really depends on a number of things. Are you a domestic student or are you an international student? If you're a... Uh, domestic student, the impacts on, on under enrollment would be Centrelink. Uh, also, it would depend on if your course requires full-time enrollment. Uh, there's a lot, of, sorry, this is not really an answer, um, but you can still, uh, technically UQ would consider a 75% load, a full-time load. So three courses, three courses. Um, don't know if faculty have any faculty specific information around that. I, th I think just as you said, Alexa, there can be exceptions to this. So really, Ella, if you're unsure about um, whether or not that's going to be qualifying as a full time load for your specific program based on your situation, you'll probably need to contact the faculty just to double check that. But as Alexa said, typically three courses is classified as full-time uh, study. Uh, if, you're a, if you're talking about as well the, the summer school, uh, I guess that might be different depending on how many subjects uh, courses you're planning on enrolling in for summer semester as well. So. Yes, very good. Okay, so the next one, my senior told me that I can choose only three courses in the first semester. Is that right? I would say no. Um, I think maybe you should uh, maybe talk to someone, an academic advisor, about what courses you are enrolled in. Uh, um, yes. Yeah, yes. as an international student, yeah, Kexon would need to enroll into eight units and they need to be eight minutes from the Bachelor of Arts. If he's in the Bachelor of Arts, um, they needs to come from the Bachelor of Arts course list. Yes. So eight units of the Bachelor of Arts enrollment must come from the course list. Yes. Uh, the uh, If you do need to talk to someone about it, I would say an academic advisor. But if you're, unless one of the courses were was four units, I would say, no, you need to be in uh, four courses. Okay, so someone's asking about the difference between the school and the faculty. So the faculty uh, is the broader organisation and the school is within the faculties. Uh, I am outside of faculty, so there might be more, there's obviously going to be nuances between different faculties. Uh, if there was anything specific that our HAS representatives wanted to highlight about the difference between the schools and in, within the faculty, I can speak to the type of questions that you should pose to both the faculty and the school administration teams. So at the faculty level, questions that you could ask to them are things related to degree, uh, to your degree, credit requests, academic progress, overseas study approval, things like that. School student administration teams. Um, so that could be like the School of Social Science or the School of Music. Uh, for them, questions related to your courses specifically, so your subjects, uh, timetabling and assessment might be some things that you might want to ask to the school student administration team. So just as some examples there. Excellent answer. Thank you. Okay, so if you have a cross-credit request ongoing, should you wait until the faculty gets back with a response about what you will count towards the program before officially enrolling. Well, that definitely sounds like something that the faculty will need to answer. Uh, have we got any insight? I can help with that one. Um, you should go ahead and enroll as though your credit 
is being approved. Um, once you get the result of your credit application, uh, you can change your enrolment accordingly. So just go ahead as though it's going to be improved, approved. Awesome. Okay, so person wants to know if your program, how do you know if a program is offered externally for semester two, 2023? Uh, I'm going to say that very few, there's very few external offerings. Uh, one way is obviously to check uh, the ECP, that will tell you, uh, but I would say that there's very little. It's a high chance it's going to be in person. Um, any further on that from faculty? That's about it for me. Yep, that's about it. That's, that's kind of what the advice that we have been given and that we're giving out. Okay, so how can you get course selection advice? That would be an academic advisor at your faculty, uh, which I can't remember the email. Um, I will, our faculty might know off the top of their heads. I will have to look it up. Where are That's, we? That's uh, at uq.edu.au. Yes, um, awesome. If they can put in the subject line, um, you know, what the general topic is that they need assistance with, that would be really handy as well, please. Yes. Uh, yes, it is also so much help, more helpful to uh, academic advisors, course coordinators and things like that and faculty if you are really concise with your question that you include your name and your student number and what program you're in. Uh, that additional information can really help speed up uh, people answering you. Okay. Just on course selection though, can I just say as a first year student, most welcome to just drop into the faculty office here on campus. Um, if you're having trouble with your enrollment or knowing what to enroll into, but once you've attended your orientation session, you should have a fair idea of what to choose from there. But um, first years don't need to make an appointment with us, they can just call us or drop into our office. Excellent advice. Okay, so the next one I will have to throw to faculty, but uh, the question is my offer said reduction to duration eight. Does that mean my study time is only 1.5 years? I don't really understand that question. So I will open it to, ha to our faculty. That may depend on what program he's in and um, or she is in before we could answer that. If it's a master's program that's normally two years duration and you have eight units credit, then it would probably, yes, reduce it to one and a half years duration. Okay. I think we need a bit more context, perhaps. For yeah, depending on what to program they're doing. Mm. Okay. So maybe talk to the faculty. Yes, please. Okay, so this person hasn't received their unconditional offer yet. Uh, can they choose still choose their courses? I don't think they'll be able to enrol without um, an offer. Okay. No, so they have to have an offer. They have to have met all the conditions of the offer um, before they can accept and get their COE if it's an international student. So no they wouldn't be able to choose courses until they've finished that entire process. Okay. Uh, the next question. So what happens if you need to defer study for a semester? What is the process? Uh, if we mean uh, deferring, so it's not starting until uh, a, a later semester, or have we started? And uh, if we if we start and then we want to take a semester off, we would call that an interruption. Uh, there is a good line on our web, uh, a good good guide on our website that can help you with that. Uh, but once again, depending on if you're domestic or international, because it might have SendLink uh, problems or visa issues. Uh, so without kind of knowing more context, we can't kind of, and also it's hard in this context to discuss all the op options. Uh, does our faculty have any maybe broad advice for if a student wants to defer, so and uh, delay their start? 
it depends again on what program they're in, uh, if it's a continuous enrollment or um, capped offers, uh, it may have have a significant effect. If they're going into the BA and they don't want to enrol in semester one, then simply don't enrol. You should have no problem enrolling into semester two. We do like you to complete at least two units in the first 12 months that you've been made an offer to your program. So it's basically just don't enrol unless your program has special rules. Okay, awesome. Uh, so uh, we're going, some of you are asking us some quite some detailed uh, specific questions. Unfortunately, we can't really answer things to each person's individual circumstances in this kind of context. So I would uh, recommend you reaching out to the faculty after this if we can't specifically answer all your questions. Uh, there is just a limit to this kind of format. Okay, so the next one we've got is, can we enrol in courses in my sign before June 19th? Yes, you can. In fact, I would recommend enrolling now now that you know how to do it um because then it's good to go when a timetabling does open uh once again like we talked about our previous person with the un with not receiving an unconditioned enrollment that obviously can impact it uh I'm not sure if there's other things that can impact it because I don't have a lot of involvement in this process but yes Okay, so the next person received an offer with 16 units reduced, but I don't know which courses were reduced and where I should find them. I feel that is another individual situation, one that we might not be able to answer, uh, but happy. I could, yeah, I can say that once you're, I'm assuming you're an international student, uh, there is that you're in a program where you've got your 16 units of credit, you should be contacted by the team here at Has to say, yes, we've posted your credit and here's a study plan for you to follow. So a study planner -er is what we call them. So if by the time you go to enrol and you still haven't received that, um, either drop into the office or send us an email. Okay. All right. Uh, the next one might be a bit more specific. I definitely cannot answer it. Um, it might involve talking to an academic advisor or some faculty. So for Master of Education Studies, no field of study option. Do these two cor uh, courses include the TESOL method to allow me to teach English to international students? I don't know if our faculty can read that and provide anything other than maybe go and talk to someone. I'm not sure uh, whether that students uh, sent their email to us and didn't get a reply if they, um, or may have sent it to somebody else. I can't see that they've sent it to us at this point, but mm. we don't have enough information to answer that. Okay, and so which um, email would you recommend them they email? Has at uq.edu.au. Awesome. Also, I suspect that it could be a question that the school or the program convener might be best place to answer. That's what Just I was going to of, say as well. Yeah, because <laughs> I've, I've sat in on this program info session and they do provide specific information related to enrolling. Mm. Um, I've got there the school's email so I just did the type answer option for that one so that'll be in the answered tab now for you so you can go grab their email and contact them. Thanks awesome. Cal. Okay, so uh, a video of this session, look, whether this specific uh, session will be uploaded or um, I am going to record a clean copy uh, and we will upload it, uh, it will probably be up on the same uh, web page that you probably got the link to this session. Uh, uh, also, I'll I'll be grabbing a copy and putting it up on the HAS orientation web pages for you. Uh, it'll be under the How to HAS series web page. So I'll pop a link there. And uh, depending on when we when we get it, I'm trying to get a lot of the content from this week out by the weekend, but potentially next week. Awesome. Very good. Uh, okay, Cal, there is a question for you. 
Yeah, I think there's been a misunderstanding here because I'm certainly not a student teacher. So I'm sorry, but yeah. I don't think I can answer that one for you. Um, if you've got questions related to, um, I guess, teaching while you're studying, I think that's probably something that would be best asked to one of your program conveners once you start. Certainly, if you attend your program information session, uh, which you should do, they will be able to definitely give you a clear answer to that one. Awesome. Okay, so the next one in a Master of Education program, uh, who are the course advisors for this program? Uh, do you mean the course coordinators? Because they should be listed in your ECPs. Uh, and then there is academic advisors at faculty. Uh, happy to for faculty to maybe clear that if there is a specific person. Yeah, it's Shirley. Uh I don't know how to pronounce her surname, but I'm just typing in the answer. So this one will be also in the answers for you. Awesome. I know Shirley. I've talked to her before. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So following up on a cross credit request, you're requesting credit for over 12 papers. So it's very hard to know at what point I start my program here. Uh, I think that's once again, you need to talk to an academic advisor. Okay, so once again, uh, a recording of this uh, and potentially alternatively a clean recording uh, will be available uh, on the HASS website uh, as well as I think there will be a general uh, website about enrolling and timetabling. Okay. Okay, so the next person has uh, where it says uh, this has been a, a course has been approved for study abroad and exchange students. That tends, I'm pretty sure that means that if you are an international student from, say, a, a an ex, uh, an international university and you come here for either a short experience, so a six week experience or a semester study. So it's been pre-approved for those people to be able to do those courses. So if you are say at Harvard and you wanna to come to UQ for a semester, uh, you have to have certain, the courses you do, you can't just pick any, you've got to have them approved. And so that's just kind of saying that these are ones that are approved for that. So it's not, it's, I don't think it's really got anything to do with uh, full-time UQ international students. It's if you're just here on an experience. Okay, so the next person wants to know if they can change their field of study after accepting the offer. Yes. Okay, awesome. I love a great to the point answer. Okay, so I'd uh, love to ask if we can enroll in courses uh, belonging to other programs, but the same school and faculty. Again, that's program specific, we, um, unless we know exactly what program the student's doing. Um, it's hard to say whether that what we would call those electives if they're not on your course list but they belong somewhere else since you're allowed to do electives it'll say so in your course list but if it's a very specific program then the answer may be no okay all right so is there a specific procedure to change plan field of study other than changing the plan through my sign it if, if the student's having trouble changing their plan and sign it, um, just email us. Some of the master's programs won't let them change easily. So uh, sometimes, depending on how many units they've done, they might be blocked from changing their plan because there isn't room in their program or with the units left over to accommodate a new major. So okay. it doesn't work on sign it, email us, please. <laughs> Another excellent answer. Okay, so the next person didn't accept the email to activate your my UQ account. I think you can get support if you just contact the student centre and they can help you with those kinds of things. Uh, and if they can't help you, then I would say IT. Okay, all right. So yes, you can start your course selection after June 19. Uh, it would be really great if you could get, uh, if you can enroll and have your timetable, uh, the first step of your timetable done before the, or oh, was it the 3rd of July? Uh, 
because that's going to get you the best outcome. Okay. All right. Uh, happy to continue answering some more questions if you want to put any more in. Uh, something that I might also just mention is we've used the term academic advisor here a few times. Uh, we have a number of different types of advisors here and people often get confused. So like I said at the beginning, I am a student advisor. Okay. So my area of expertise is helping international students settle in, uh, helping students with welfare. Uh, so emergency accommodation, things like that, as well as helping with disability support. Okay. So that's the kind of things that a student advisor uh, can help you with. So we are based out of uh, Building 42. Uh, if you're ever on St. Lucia campus, uh, it's the building with the big gold rings. If you get lost and you need to go find us, go, where is the building with the big gold rings? Uh, so we are not faculty specific, so we cannot answer questions about your course or program. That's why we have our, our amazing colleagues here from the Haas faculty today, because you can tell that they're answering these questions a lot better than I can. Okay, if you do need questions about your course or program, you do need to talk to your faculty and uh, most likely an academic advisor. Okay, now the, to make it even more confusing, we have a third type of advisor here. We've got what we call a learning advisor. So they are not faculty specific either. They are sit alongside us. They're actually right next to us in the office. Uh, and so they are learning advisors. So they can help you uh, incorporate feedback from course coordinators back into your work, help you improve uh, the way you answer questions, help you with planning, help you break down what uh, your assessment pieces are, those kinds of things, okay? So a student advisor is not faculty specific and we talk about welfare and disability and settling in, okay? So if you need support in those, make sure you go to a student advisor. If you need help with understanding your assessments, uh, incorporating feedback, those kinds of things, then you need a learning advisor, okay? And they are also not faculty specific. Some faculties and schools might have specific learning advisors, uh, but the main ones when you Google uh, UQ learning advisor are not faculty specific, okay? And then you have an academic advisor who can answer those faculty specific questions. Uh, like your course and program selections, okay? So that's something that's really useful to understand the difference uh, because I do regularly have students coming to me with course and program selection questions and I say, unfortunately, I cannot help you. Okay, is there any other questions? What's the time? We've got a few more minutes if anyone had any uh, last minute burning questions. Uh, but if you are having questions that are very specific to your program, uh, please contact the faculty. Anyone else? Uh, our learned uh, colleagues at faculty, is there anything else that you would like to say before we wrap up the session? I think just thank you everybody for jumping online. There are a number of other workshops that you should really consider attending during the week prior to orientation week. So they're all listed on the website under the How to Has series. Uh, so these are sessions that uh, there's one that is, again, in collaboration with student services, but there are others in collaboration with the library to uh, step you through things like your learn.uq platform, so Blackboard, uh, as well as IT essentials. So things like, you know, getting Wi-Fi on campus, printing, um, navigating through the library as well. So there's a heap of good stuff in those sessions. So you will be receiving emails from us, but I would really recommend that you come along to those sessions. Uh, for those of you who can't make it, that's fine, but we will be seeing you, hopefully all of you, on the 17th, which is Hass's uh, main day for orientation activities and throughout the rest of our week. Thank you. Uh while we are talking about O-Week, there will be a whole range of uh, things both online and in person. So we will also have a number of workshops, things like safety in Australia. Uh, so it's not just about all our scary animals. It's also about the sun and keeping yourself safe from scams and things like that. Uh, there's things like on Aussie culture. Uh, if you need help finding accommodation, because accommodation is quite hard to find at the moment in Brisbane, uh, we've also... Uh, 
previously done some workshops on that. They will be online and there will be more. Uh, there will be some welcome to UQ. So uh, some broad things about accessing things at UQ, welcome to the different uh, locations and things like that. So there's a whole range of them. So make sure you're attending all those uh, if they are in person or online and just really enjoying O Week because there will be a lot to do. Okay. All right. Well, if there is no more questions, I will say uh, thank you everyone for attending today. It's been a really great session. Uh, thank you to my two colleagues at the Haas faculty for all their really invaluable, really great answers that they have been able to provide us. Uh, if you are still struggling with uh, some of the topics that we talked about here, then please uh, contact the Haas faculty. Uh, if not, welcome to UQ. Uh, I'm sure you'll have a great time when you're here. Uh, and if you get stuck or you are worried, please reach out. You don't have to struggle through, through things alone. Okay. All right. Well, best of luck with everything. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody.